Hi, I'm Katie Culver, and we're back with another Media Law Chat. Today, I am delighted to welcome a Media Law Scholar and very, very dear friend, Jason Shepard. Jason, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, and what top case we're going to be talking about today. So hi, Katie. I'm Jason Shepard. I am a professor and chair of the Department of Communications at Cal State Fullerton, uh, south of Los Angeles. Um, I've been here about 10, 10 or 11, 11 years. Um, before that, I was with you uh, in, um, in Madison. I have my uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD from the J School at UW-Madison. I also was a reporter um, for the Capital Times and Isthmus newspaper uh, and grew up in Wisconsin. So uh, it's always good to spend time with Katie Culver. And I love spending time with you, Jason. So what are we talking about today? So we're going to be talking about the Brandsburg v. Hayes uh, decision in 1972. And why is that one of your top cases? I know why it's near and dear to your heart. You tell everybody else why. Yeah, so, you know, um, I really first became interested in Brandsburg v. Hayes and the concept of journalist um, privilege um, really as a result of my work as a, as a journalist and the occasional use of confidential sources in sensitive reporting um, and breaking some significant news as a reporter. And then when I transitioned to graduate school, um, I focused on kind of the concept of journalist privilege, both um, in, in media law, but also journalism ethics and the um, uh, different aspects of both ethical decision-making and legal uh, protections, how that varies in co context when it comes to journalists um, using confidential sources and then somebody wanting journalists to um, reveal who those sources are for a variety of reasons. So it was kind of a professional interest for me as a journalist and then uh, a scholarly interest really from my uh, first semester in the master's program uh, working on a paper uh, through my master's thesis and PhD dissertation, which ultimately I turned into a book about journalist privilege. Yeah, you and Brandsburg have been together for a long, long time. Yeah, it's, it's uh, one of those cases that um, I feel like I uh, have lived and breathed for a, a long time. All right, so tell us, tell us why it's such a fascinating case. What are, what are aspects of the case that, that are truly important um, for people to understand? Well, you know, I think it's, it's, um, it's an interesting case for um, a number of reasons. Well, first, it's, it's a, not a good outcome for journalists. And so the Supreme Court voted five to four um, that the First Amendment did not provide, does not provide uh, a journalist privilege um, rooted in the First Amendment to allow journalists to avoid compelled disclosure of sources, at least when it comes to grand jury subpoenas. So um, it, it was a bad outcome for um, journalists, but it's one of these weird cases where the, uh, because of the way that the justices voted, um, really turned into a case where the concurrence and the dissent really were, um, had kind of an uh, outsized influence in lower court interpretations of the case over the years. So um, it ultimately became a, a case where um, hundreds of lower court decisions over the years have looked to the dissent to be kind of the controlling or a part of the controlling holding of the case. Yeah, so the dissent articulates um, articulates a way to think about this that ultimately was influential more so than the majority opinion, which is just fascinating. There, uh, can you think of other situations where that's happened, where we've had a dissent that had that kind of power? Maybe Holmes and Abrams um, would have that kind of power, but but this yeah, one, maybe you're right. Some of those cases, the early cases, sort of that framed the modern thinking about the First Amendment from the you know, 1919 to 1927 period um, would be another good example where over time the dissents really were what were significant about those cases. Um, you know, we haven't gotten to that point in Brandsburg where the dissents now has been embraced by a new Supreme Court as the mm -hmm. central holding and really I'd be surprised if that, if that did happen given the current um, political and legal, legal climate. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it, it was really in, um, so as part of my, my book um, and my dissertation research, I interviewed um, James Goodall, who is a, a, a historic First Amendment lawyer in the 1970s, who um, made the argument that uh, Justice Stewart's dissent really is the controlling opinion. And he wrote a law journal article and then began to litigate cases trying to advance that argument. And he uh, convinced a number of justice, a number of judges, lower court judges, to find a qualified journalist privilege, both rooted in the First Amendment and in common law. Um, mm -hmm. And so he, um, uh, in these interviews that I did with him, you know, really described how there was a lot of intellectual work and a lot of on the ground legal representation of journalists who suddenly after, after the Brandsburg in 1972, a number of journalists started being subpoenaed for their sources. They uh, had to get lawyers to uh, argue their cases in courts and Goodall and others were able to convince judges to side with the journalists that that sort of created this this federal common law um, privilege. So a, a case really um, unique in that aspect where the dissent through a lot of work became the prevailing legal view for a number of years. Now that changed starting in the 2000s, but the, the federal qualified privilege really started after Randsburg and then really expanded through about 2003. And so uh, what and why the change in the 2000s? So a number of, a number of things. Um, there were several high profile cases in which journalists um, were um, fighting compelled disclosure and, and lost their cases. Mm -hmm. So there was sort of this, uh, a lot of media attention, a lot of uh, scrutiny about one one involved uh, a freelance reporter in Texas, Vanessa Leggett, who um, was working on a story about a local murder and had developed connections with the FBI and had gotten some information. Um, she ultimately went to jail and lost her case. There was a blogger in San Francisco, Josh Wolf, who refused to turn over um, video that he recorded at a protest. Police were trying to find out, um, find evidence of who maybe vandalized a police car and they um, seized his camera and he served um, uh, more than a half a year in federal prison fighting that subpoena. And then the biggest case was really um, probably the Judith Miller case. Judith Miller was a reporter at the New York Times who um, was subpoenaed to reveal her sources. Ultimately, um, one of her sources was identified as Scooter Libby, the chief of staff of then Vice President Dick Cheney. Um, and you know, Judy Miller maybe did some, some people would say, some questionable reporting tactics, but she really was doing her job as a, as a journalist, getting information from high-level sources in the context that subpoena was in the context of um, potential manipulation of intelligence leading to the U.S. getting involved in the Iraq war. So those three, three cases, Vanessa Leggett, Josh Wolf, and Judy Miller, all journalists lost their cases. So that was a lot of attention about really how strong is this concept of a legal journalist privilege, at least when it comes to federal law. And then um, another significant occurrence in the 2000s was a weird case out of Chicago in which um, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, prominent judge Richard Posner um, wrote a decision uh, about a privilege case in which he said, look, all these hundreds of cases that have interpreted Brandsburg uh, to say that there's a federal qualified privilege, they're wrong. I've reread Brandsburg and it was a five to four decision saying there is no First Amendment privilege. And so because of Richard Posner's kind of outsized influence in the legal community, that also gave a lot of attention to saying, maybe we need to, judges and the people who wanted to subpoena journalists were thinking, maybe we need to rethink um, our arguments about uh, the privilege based on just, or Judge, Judge Posner's uh, interpretation of Brandsburg really, and it was not, it's hard to argue that he was incorrect in saying Brandsburg's holding is there's no First Amendment based journalist privilege, at least in the context of federal grand jury subpoenas. Yeah, you know, it's one thing that always fascinates me about the, about, about the Brandsburg case, but just privilege in general, is that, you know, these don't tend to be 
fishing expedition subpoenas, right, that are, that are getting fought. You know, they, they're, they're consequential cases. Um, you, know, you know, maybe vandalizing a police car, not such a consequence consequential case, but, but, you know, violating um, classification rules and, you know, potentially um, damaging national security, the, the, there's, there's consequences here. And I think it's an interesting element, um, you know, do you have any sense of public opinion, like how often um, people support, you know, I can see the average person saying, well, if I have to testify, why wouldn't a journalist have to testify? You know, and I think in 1972, in the 1970s, that was a high watermark for public support of investigative journalism. And if the, uh, over time, I think the support has waned. I think we can see that in the context of um, President Trump's criticism of the media and me the journalism, journalists being the enemy of the people. Um, I do think public opinion um, has shown a decreasing support for journalists at a broad scale, and that probably translates to, um, to these cases. You're right in a lot of the cases that we hear about are tough calls. I mean, the most, one of the most recent cases of a, of a, of a um, source going to prison for providing information to a journalist um, is the case involving a, a woman named Reality Winner, who was a, um, uh, uh, a um, working for a government contractor who provided uh, a document to the website, The Intercept, in the early days of the uh, investigation into um, Russian hacking and Russian involvement in the 2016 election. You know, that she is not a popular person. She is not viewed as a whistleblower. She's viewed as a traitor by a lot of people. And so, the, especially when it comes to national security reporting and somebody revealing classified information to a journalist, that, um, you know, partly that is what journalists do. Journalists covering national security need sources who are going to provide them critical information, contextual information, and the overclassification of government secrets is a real problem. But the public support, I think, um, is not on the journalist side in a lot of cases. Now, the Brandsburg decision involved three journalists who one was reporting about the local marijuana trade. One was reporting about um, the black, uh, two others were reporting about the black Panther movement. And those, you know, those are not in the same category as national security secrets. So those should have been, or could have been um, uh, cases in which the public really probably supported the journalists view. Mm -hmm. You know, we have in law a lot of privileges we, uh, uh, of uh, uh, allowing people not to provide testimony or compulsory information. So, you know, doctor-patient privilege is one, um, you know, um, a spousal privilege, a spouse can't be required to testify against somebody else. There's lots of privileges that the law recognizes to protect certain relationships. And so mm -hmm. journalist source relationships, um, it's not accurate to say that the journalist privilege is giving journalists sort of special rights that other people don't have. We recognize privileges in a lot of contexts mm -hmm. because of the public interest that the right. protecting that relationship serves. Where do you think today's court would fall? What, what, what might be the vote on Brandsburg today? Uh, it, it could well be 5-4 or 6-3 against a journalist, depending mm -hmm. on the context. I think, um, you know, as a matter of interpretation of the First Amendment, there is not a lot of movement that has been made between 1972 and today that would, would, would justify a major re-envisioning of how the press clause protects the journalist profession, for example. Um, you know, but the First Amendment and the Supreme Court is not the only place that provides a source of, of legal protection for journalists. And we have seen uh, in the last two generations, legislatures and states um, providing uh, either common law protections or shield laws in the form of legislation, giving journalists privilege protection. So that's kind of a bright spot mm -hmm. in um, the legal ev evolution. 49 out of the 50 states provide some um, legal protections for journalists and protecting confidential sources. Congress has um, 
debated more than 100 bills since 1972. Uh, and they came really close um, a couple of years ago during when President Obama was president. And one of the leading advocates for journalist privilege legislation in the House of Representatives was Mike Pence. And so uh, Mike Pence are, made the conservative argument about the need and the importance of journalists having protections to be a check on government and to hold the powerful accountable. Um, and so that sentiment has been expressed in Congress. It's gotten a majority of votes in the House multiple times, but each time a bill has come close to becoming law, something happens in which uh, legislators get scared about providing journalists these protections, and then uh, the bill does not become a law. Yeah, it's fascinating. The state protections, I think, are important. And I, th I think um, you do see that idea that it's a check on governmental power. And not just, not just that journalists would, are holding, the power, holding power to account, but also trying to restrain overzealous prosecutors. That, you know, that, that if there is a place that government can wield power, it is in the criminal justice system and that, and that we need some, we need to tap the brakes on that power in some ways. And, and, and I think that is where you see some kind of interesting uh, cross the aisle kind of support that, you know, people have different reasons for doing um, what they do, but, um, but they can find a path forward. So Jason, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. I know, I know this is an interesting case across the board, but it's been a, a particular part of your legacy as a scholar. So thank you so much for talking with us. Thanks, Katie, and it's always great to see you. All right. Bye-bye, Jason.